Thanks for joining us for another episode of Oklahoma Senate Sit Down. Uh, I'm happy to be joined today by Senator Gary Stanislavski from the great city of Tulsa. Uh, he's joining us today. He's the chair of the Senate Education Committee, uh, and he also happens to be the longest tenured member of the Senate, uh, aka the Dean of the Senate. So, Senator Stanislavski, we're glad to have you on the Senate Sit Down uh, show today. Thanks for joining us. Thank you, Ernest. It's a pleasure to be here. So you represent District 35, which I said was uh, in Tulsa, but can you give us a bit more of a specific description of your district, the boundaries where it lies, some of the cities, other smaller cities that may be in your district? Sure, actually it encompasses only Tulsa. Okay. And my Northern boundary uh, actually is the University of Tulsa. Uh, I also pick up a large hospital, St. John's. And then as I come down the river, on one side, on the uh, west side of my district, and then pretty much Harvard going south. I'll also pick up Oral Roberts University. So I'm very uh, pleased to be able to represent two very distinguished uh, private universities. All right. And then I go all the way down to 121st in Yale, so north south, about 10 miles. And what's amazing is sometimes I'll talk with folks in the district and they'll I describe the boundaries and they'll say how large that district is. Yeah. And I have to remind them I'm like the third or fourth smallest district in the state. <laughs> so you're compacted, uh, but there's still people. That's an interesting uh, thing talking to members of the Senate who are urban members of this uh, represent urban areas of the state or those who represent rural areas. What, what are some of the uh, differences you think in serving an urban section of the state versus rural? I mean, how, how would it be different you think? Well, uh, a lot of it is a, a part of my district is deals with Tulsa public schools. Mm -hmm. And so that is very urban and uh, the school district is, is quite large. Uh, I have within my district, I have poverty, but I have a lot of uh, uh, businesses and a lot of wealth in the district. Uh, the Southern part of the district is under Jinx public schools and so it's it's designed differently as well right. and um so compare that to a rural district where the primary uh income sources may be um farming ranching uh oil and gas uh, those type of activities manufacturing perhaps whereas within my district it's uh within the district itself it's primarily either education um medical right uh, uh, are the two primary uh job creators and then a lot of just retail businesses and that's that's what i hear from other members is that uh you're compact and you have a smaller number of school districts or cities that you represent for a rural person they may have 13 counties each with a county c each of those counties may have five ten school districts so uh as far as the the entities you represent may be a little different. I've also heard kind of the uh, in the rural parts of the state when you serve in the legislature, you're more, I guess you might say you're more famous or you're more well known. So that right. when you're at home and you're at church or you're going to the store, uh, people know who you are and recognize you and come up to you and talk about the issues or how things are going to the Capitol. Whereas someone like you, uh, Senator Treat says this a lot when he's in his district, like even people in his own neighborhood don't know. Uh, that he serves in the legislature just because again we're more compact and it's it's easier to kind of blend into the background a little bit true i don't do a lot of uh pie tasting contests <laughs> or judging of livestock right uh the various fundraisers the different uh local communities have uh so it's it, it is totally a different uh t different type of deal here and, and and he's exactly right uh, a lot of folks do not know that i am their senator um, unless they just happen to read something that I had sent out and right. then they catch it. Right, right. Well, let's talk about uh, this year. Uh, uh, as I mentioned, you're the, the dean of the Senate and due to term limits, you, you uh, can't run, you're not eligible for re-election this year. So this would, was your last session and it turned out uh, we gave you one for the, for the record books, for the history books, uh, your last session. So tell me a little bit about your thoughts overall. I mean, we had budget issues we had to deal with. We had a health pandemic we had to deal with that impacted how we operated and, and the types of issues we had to take up. 
Uh, so tell me a little bit about your thoughts on this session uh, in the sort nature of it. It was quite a session. Um, so I, I came into the Senate, I was sworn in in 2008. And my first session then was 2009. Mm -hmm. And as I reflected back for the last 12 years, I've had, uh, I think about eight years where we've had to have some type of budget cuts. Uh, and a couple of years where things were stable. Right. And then a couple of years where there was some growth. Right. Uh, this year encompassed all of that. At the beginning of the year, we thought we might have some slight growth. Uh, and then going into the year, a slight decrease. And then with the pandemic, with the businesses being shut down, with the just devastation to oil and gas, right. and the number of wells being shut down, uh, oversupply, not enough demand, uh, going, finishing before the end of session, having to cut 1.3 billion, I believe it was. Uh, that was what a roller coaster of a year. Yeah. Uh, how we approached everything was different as well. We started off the session normal, a great state of the state address, things are flowing smooth, committees are working, right. and then right after, or the week of, transferring Senate bills to the House and receiving House bills to the Senate, COVID really hits, mm. and basically put a standstill to the Senate and the House. Um, it took time to develop systems and processes um, that Actually, I think in the long run, it's going to turn out to be very good for the people of Oklahoma uh, with the way that the Senate handled uh, committee meetings uh, so that uh, we remotely could still work with uh, executive nominations, for instance, and get them passed, committee members being able to voice uh, uh, their concerns or acknowledge their positive attributes. Uh, to be able to vote, and all of that, all of that uh, was done with enhanced transparency. Uh, anyone uh, could log in and, uh, and see the proceedings. So I think that's a definite benefit for the people of Oklahoma. It, it's, it's a benefit to have systems now. Yeah. That in the event we have to go through some other type of, uh, whether it's a pandemic or some type of natural disaster, to know that we have rules and policies in place that uh, the people of the state can be assured that their elected officials can still meet, right. still discuss, make appropriate decisions, um, and, and yet be very transparent so they can see what is going on. And I think what also was remarkable is how we changed the laws to allow cities and counties yeah. Uh, boards, commissions, to be able to do the same thing so that the, the business of the state could continue with minimal impact on the citizens. It's interesting you mentioned that because we did that so that uh, governments and, and, and local governments could continue operation during the midst of the pandemic. But it's, it's interesting to see how that opened it up so that more members of the public, I think, would be able to participate and follow along because it's not always easy you are a former member of a school board. It's not always easy for everyone to come to a school board meeting at six or five, six, seven o'clock at night uh, when you have kids that are doing homework or you got to take care of or you're working or whatever. But since that meeting went online during the pandemic, I think more people had the opportunity to watch and see what was going on, observe, become more informed. And it went all the way from the city level to the state level um, with state agencies, boards and commissions. So we've heard a lot of positive feedback from it. I think it was something interesting that arose out of this that will, I think, carry forward moving forward. And it makes sense because it's how much technology impacts our life on a daily basis anyway. Right. Right. And, and to put safeguards on the meetings to ensure that it, when you're taking a vote, right, that uh, every member has to be uh, not just audio, but visual as well. Yeah. Uh, so the, the security of knowing that it was a valid uh, vote um, it is so extremely important. And, and yet we did that and um, the business was conducted. So yeah. feel real good about uh, overall how things went. And even though we were interrupted by quarantine in the Senate, uh, we still were able to pass uh, some good uh, legislation and not just things related to the pandemic, but uh, other issues, important issues like education. You're a 
longtime champion of education issues at the Capitol. You've been the chair of the Senate Education Committee for a few years. And this year, you, uh, you were able to pass a few bills uh, related to education. What are a couple of those uh, to highlight and how they impact uh, education here in the state moving forward? Sure. Um, before I actually get into the specific bills, uh, I'd like to address my overall philosophy of yeah, education. Yeah, please do, please do. Okay, so one of, as a result of serving on a school board for eight years, uh, one of the things that really the other board members uh, drilled into me is that as a board, when, whenever we made a decision, the most important thing we had to look at first and foremost was the impact on the students. Right, right. And is this decision going to enhance learning for those students or will it take away learning opportunities? So if we are going to put more mandates on teachers, for instance, mm -hmm. and it requires more paperwork, well, will that decision then decrease the amount of time teacher has to prepare right. uh, or to actually conduct class? Mm -hmm. So every decision uh, I've every decision I made, I try to use that lens. What is the impact on the student? And then broaden it out, the impact on the teachers, the administrators, the parents, right. um, and overall system. Mm -hmm. But that has always been my guiding light. So if some might agree or disagree with certain decisions, they could at least uh, look and acknowledge the fact that it was made uh, specifically with the student in mind first. Uh, with that, there were a few bills. Uh, for instance, House Bill 3466 this year, I was the Senate author on, mm -hmm. and it dealt with uh, redesigning the textbook committee. Mm -hmm. So last year during the interim, I had an interim study uh, that, that really addressed issues within our textbook committee and how they conducted business statewide versus other states. And we found that there are a few other states that really had a, a, a better system. Right. Uh, and that's what this bill was all about. And primarily a couple of distinctions in it is, uh, whereas before the textbook committee would just either say, yes, a textbook is on the state adoption list or no, this time um, and going forward, the committee members now will work through a rubric and the rubric will um, address different strengths and weaknesses of the, of the different curriculum. So it doesn't have to be specifically a textbook. It could also be um, some learning resources over the internet, uh, but primarily textbooks. And by having the rubric, they can ultimately say, yes, this book meets standards. However, in certain areas, let's use history for instance, in certain areas of history, there needs to be a supplement to make sure that okay. our state standards are being covered. I see. That's the power of the, the change on this textbook committee. And as always, however, we made sure that the local school board in the local district had final say over what books they were going to use. Right, right. Uh, and so I, I felt really good about what we passed in the design that you know, might enhance learning for students. I was gonna say, it sounds like it could increase the, uh, maybe the quality of the instructional material, which will help the students and their achievement um, long-term. That's correct. Yeah. Um, another bill is Senate Bill 212. And 212 uh, dealt with virtual charter schools. Mm -hmm. So back in, I believe it was 2012, I had passed uh, did a lot of research on and passed the original bill dealing with full-time virtual charter schools and, and and that bill had also set up the uh, Oklahoma statewide virtual school board and many many other things one of the provisions in the bill dealt with how these students or the schools would be funded each year and there was a a technical glitch I guess in the language from truly what the intent was. And what that glitch was is the language stated that every year a virtual charter school would start the year with, uh, you take the number of students they had the prior year and multiply it by a factor of 1.33, that's the weights of those students, weights for 
um, maybe um, intellectual disabilities or maybe it's um, higher achievers, so it's, so it's, it's additional weights there, or right. grade weights, but it, but it was a flat 1.33. And so every year uh, for the last eight years, these virtual schools would be, uh, for the most part, underfunded. And then the mid-year adjustment, they would receive much more money right. because they were underfunded at the beginning of the year. Right. And that, that was never my intent. So finally, this year, we were able to get passed and the governor signed, uh, removing that uh, 1.33 weight other than a first time, first year virtual or traditional charter school. That's what it's all about, just the first year. Right. But then every year thereafter, they carry over the weights, they carry over their student count, um, and, and then that can change during the first nine weeks. If, if student count is lower, they could receive less. And then, but finally, at the mid-year adjustment, what should happen is um, all schools will have minor adjustments based upon enrollment, but we will know, we'll no longer see major changes just on the virtual side. It, it should solve a lot of issues for many, many of our great schools, our traditional public schools, as well as the virtual schools. That sounds like a great example too of uh, you pass a bill and something started happening that you didn't intend, but you're able to identify it, reconcile it, and improve the process of legislation going on. And that that happens all the time, I think, at the Capitol. And people don't realize is that we do pay attention to the bills passed and the impact they have. And if it's not what we intended, we oftentimes go back and change to address any issues that may arise. So that sounds like a great example of how that process works. Yeah, it, it, it really is. We always were on the lookout for unintended consequences. Right. Yet you never know how something might play out in actual uh, practice as opposed to just what's on paper. Yeah. And so it was a great, great cleanup bill is what we'd say. Right. Um, uh, Senate bill, or I'm sorry, House bill 3400. I thought it was a great bill this year. Very proud to have my name on that. And 3400 um, was a priority of the governor as well as my house co-author. Uh, and essentially what it did was it required all public schools to offer at least four advanced placement courses by the school year 24-25. So they have four years to work this out. Right. Now, if I recall correctly, there are like 36 advanced placement courses available. Uh, the kids in my district, of which I was on the school board, were very blessed. We had local teachers certified, and as I recall, about 32 of the 36 areas. So there was a broad range of topics that students could take and truly excel. And potentially, if they pass the exam with a three or better, three out of four, uh, was the scoring range if they get a three or better they qualify for college credit yeah that's that's huge yeah so what i did not realize until this last year was how many schools how many high schools were not offering any ap courses wow zero and that was truly disappointing because with te the technology today there's really no reason why we cannot offer students advanced courses and, and help them achieve academically toward their career goals. Mm -hmm. uh, and so one of the methods is offering virtual courses. Uh, and it could be through a vendor of their choice, um, the school district's choice or the student's choice. A second method uh, could be um, in alignment with a career tech. Right. So many career techs offer already advanced placement courses or um, other college granting uh, right. courses and so all the school has to do is is um, sign agreements with a local career tech um, there are other ways there are like four or five different methods that school districts can use to implement this law and i just think it's the right thing to do for kids uh, take away any limitation that we might have and just remove the barriers and let more kids take AP courses and um, or, or concurrent courses where they're yeah, actually. I, I mean, if you're a, that's, that's big for the student. If you're a junior, sophomore, junior, senior, 
uh, and you're thinking about what you're going to do after high school, college, or career tech, or something like that, being able to get credit for that before you actually enroll in a university or go to a, a specific course for your career, I mean, that'd be huge. Save you time, save you money, and, and it's good for the student, which you said should be paramount in all the education policy that we do. Oh, yes. And what we know is if a high school student will take a concurrent enrolled course or an AP course, their junior or senior year, mm -hmm. um, especially if they're if they have family members that have never gone to college, uh, then if they can be successful, uh, the likelihood of them going to college is much much greater than not taking a AP or concurrent course. Right. Uh, they're just very unlikely uh, to go to college. So yeah. this really gives them a, a head start and. Uh, helps them to see that, yes, they can do it and helps our entire state, but yeah, that's uh, awesome. especially those kids. That's awesome. Yeah. And um, uh, finally, another one uh, dealt with uh, just, it's a fiscal bill, uh, House Bill uh, 3964. We had, there are restrictions on how much money local school boards can carry over to the next year. Right. Uh, we want to make sure as public policy that the schools use the money that they're given, not just store it up, mm -hmm. but use the money for uh, increased salaries for teachers or, or better curriculum for students. Um, so there are limitations on what they can carry over. What this bill uh, did uh, was for this year, remove the carryover restrictions, the caps. And the purpose behind it is with a shortened school year due to COVID-19, there will be some districts that will not have expended all their right. money. Right. Uh, other districts may have spent more money uh, because of the demands of uh, having to have home educate uh, or get materials home to the right. students. So we didn't know. And so we wanted to create maximum flexibility for our schools and it just simply removed the cap and um, for this year and allow those schools to do what is in the best interest of their students uh, without the state telling them uh, that they have to spend the money when they may not have had a requirement right then and there. Right, right. So, so that's, that's really all the bills this year that I felt were the most significant that uh, I was very proud to, to be a part of. So, so let me hit you with this question. You may have, I'm sure you've been asked uh, this before. Um, as you look back over your career, um, and I'll limit it to the education world because I know that's so near and dear to you. What, what do you think are, is the biggest or a couple of the biggest issues that you've worked on, authored legislation, and, and in, uh, implemented changes that are, are having a big impact? Tell us something about that. Well, uh, that's a great question. So one advantage I had uh, was having served on a school board for eight years, um, having really attended a lot of functions when the, within the district, mm -hmm. seeing the policies that we created as a board, how they were worked out in the classroom, the differences those policies made. Sometimes uh, they didn't weren't positive so you got rid of it uh, right. many times they were positive and and trying to work with the teachers to make sure we had good good policy and the administrators mm -hmm. um, there was one bill and it was my very first bill that uh, I was I guess most proud of uh, and, and, and will always be and that is um, uh, on the board every year we had to contract with our teachers by middle of March, March 15th, I believe it was. Mm -hmm. That would contract us for the following school year. Now, what's interesting was if a, if a teacher found a different opportunity and it enhanced their career, mm -hmm. we would allow them to break the contract and go ahead and move on 99% uh, okay. of the time. That was our board policy. But on the other hand, by having the contract, and especially that early, it bound us as a board. And I found that really unfair to our students because if we're contracting with the student with the teachers and yet we have to wait until the end of may to get our budget from right. the state right. we know how much we're going to get from local sources but not the state sources and if the state 
is uh, going through some type of recession and, and our education budget is going to be cut. And yet we contracted with X number of teachers and we don't have the money to pay for them. That is going to impact students and in the quality of materials that they receive and the school year uh, hours of work. I mean, just everything. And so uh, I'm a very pragmatic person when I, all I do is I see a problem and try to fix it. And in this case, the fix was just simply moving the contract date back to June. Yeah. Uh, yeah. When does a school board meet? Usually meets the first Monday of every month. And so the first Monday of June, we would now know our budget. That's still several months before school starts. Teachers would know if we're contracted. Um, we'd still try to send out a, a preliminary letter earlier saying uh, if funds are available, yes, well, we would love to retain you. And, um, so trying to be fair with all parties concerned. Um, but what I found was that was a very uh, divisive issue. What I thought would be very simple and straightforward is a business decision. Right. Uh, boy, that was very div divisive. And, and only because there were changes within the makeup of the Senate and the House, um, did it, was that bill even heard? It passed, it passed the House. The governor, uh, who was of the opposite party, agreed. It was just, it just made sense and, um, and signed the bill and it became law. And so I'm proud of that because what it told me is that even though many people are resistant to change, I think we all are to some degree, aren't we? Sure. Yeah, we resist change. We don't know what's going to happen. And, and, you know, the, there were people saying, if this bill passes, or we're going to lose thousands of teachers because they're going to go to other states to get a contract earlier. Well, none of that happened. Mm -hmm. Teachers were quite happy. I mean, they were fine. Um, but it, it just demonstrated that we could put our, our party, our, our public policy, which in this case is what's benefiting students ahead of what the current policy is. And uh, we all came together, it ultimately got passed, and that's why I'm so proud of it, is I truly believe it's making an impact within the local districts that is very, very positive. Um, I also, over my tenure, I guess, I'm very, very happy to be, have been asked to consider looking at virtual education. Yeah. I had no interest initially, but when someone had asked me and uh, um, when I did the research, we did a task force, um, actually a couple of them, and started incrementally making changes. Uh, I think that has made a difference uh, and helped many districts, even going through what we experienced this last session with COVID. Yeah. Because yeah. I do know there were over now over 200 local school districts offering full time virtual to their students and some form of part-time virtual as well to accommodate student needs. Mm -hmm. And while it wasn't uh, uh, a, an immediate fix for all districts, at least those 200 had some type of awareness and public policy or school board policy, and they, they could more easily adapt. Yeah. Uh, other parts of the state, um, the internet is still an issue of having uh, high-speed internet. Uh, urban areas, issue of many families that just may not even have a computer in their home, let alone internet. And so there's still some struggles, uh, but it helped. I think the, the, the framework that we came up with many years ago helped uh, many schools. And, uh, and so I'm very proud of that to be able to be just my part of helping kids in this area. It's certainly not the be all end all for all kids. It's, it's really not. Virtual is not. Yeah. But it is such a huge benefit for some. And that's what we're all about is how do we help every student? And so I'm very proud of that. That's right. Um, let me get your take. Um, eight years on the school board, you will have served 12 years in the legislature. I'm just curious as someone, uh, you know, I would call you an expert in the field. What do you think are you positive uh, in, uh, about the state of education in Oklahoma? Do you think, uh, w despite our challenges, are, are we heading in the right direction? I mean, here at the legislature two years ago, we made a huge investment uh, to help teachers and help schools. And so I'm just curious as your take on 
how education is and and here in Oklahoma and where we maybe need to go yeah. in a few years. So I think as a state, we are definitely moving in the right direction for education. Um, and you know, that's a big word, education. Yeah. Uh, education encompasses higher ed and helping students uh, earn uh, back bachelor's, uh, you know, associates, bachelor, uh, associates degrees, bachelor's degrees, masters or doctorates. Right. Uh, but education is so critical as well with uh, through our career tech system and helping people earn certificates, mm -hmm. which very often, if you earn the right certificates, you earn a lot of money. Uh, but it's not just about the money that you earn. It's about the ability to provide for your family, your children, and give them more opportunities. And so education for uh, high school students, uh, you know, uh, second graders to high school students to uh, college and career to adults that are coming back to finish their uh, degrees or to receive another certificate. Mm -hmm. I think we're doing a very, very good job in, in uh, having a cohesive uh, effort of all types of education for right. all types of learners within our state. Many states uh, do not have, the, uh, many, many states do not have the career tech system that we have. Yeah. And so to have the, uh, to really give the offerings that we do is very important. Um, I think we're moving in the right direction to uh, ensure our, our, our kids can read. Uh, we've uh, just a year ago, finally fully funded our third grade right. reading. Um, and that is so significant. Mm -hmm. uh, we're moving in the right direction that we're offering different types of schooling, different way, methods, uh, whether it's homeschool, charter school, virtual school, traditional public school. Uh, there, it's, it's important that we keep up with, with what's going on in, in right. other states and other communities. And I think we're really doing that. Uh, have we arrived? Do we have the outcomes that we would like to see today? No. There's still more work to be done, um, but I think we are we we did good work by increasing teacher salaries so we can get high quality teachers in our classrooms. Uh, we did the right thing by ensuring that there's a certain number of days in a classroom. Um, right. I think we've done quite a bit in education, and there's still more to do. I, I'm, I'm looking forward to seeing what comes out of the state as well as local districts, very innovative districts within our state that are doing incredible things. Uh, having a uh, college in a high school, yeah, uh, there are districts doing that. And just trying to uh, really increase the standards for kids um, and, and giving them more opportunities. I, I'm so proud of uh, Oklahoma School of Science and Math and what they achieve with students. And, um, and how that's advancing our state as well. So um, I, I'm thankful that I was given the opportunity to have my part to play in the legislature for 12 years. I'm grateful for my constituents to, to elect me and, and send me to the Capitol. And I know it's only a small part, but I'm so thankful for the part that I was able to play and to, to really help make a difference for the lives of all kids across our state. Well, I'm, and I'm sure your impact was farther than you even um, realize, and, and we're certainly thankful for your service. So before we have a few more minutes left here on the podcast, I want to get to some, some lighter fare. Uh, so I, I'm just curious, uh, you were elected in 2008, and now uh, it's 2020. So what do you think would be uh, some of the, or I guess a better way to ask this question would be, how has the Senate changed uh, during your tenure? Uh, Anything stick out in your mind is how the Senate has changed? Well, I can say um, when I was first elected, it seemed to be more partisan mm -hmm. within the Senate. Uh, some of the, uh, I guess, debates, not just on the floor, but in committees, and then some of the, what seemed to be more partisanship behind the scenes of, of trying to make you know, the other party look bad uh, was much greater. Mm -hmm. As I'm leaving, uh, what I witnessed were uh, senators from 
both sides of the aisle working very well together with one goal in mind, and that's serving the constituents within the state. And I think we worked very well together uh, uh, in making changes due to COVID, uh, worked very well together in communication, uh, any type of change, uh, uh, you know, in the Republican Party, we had great respect for our Democrats mm -hmm. and, and made sure that they were given information before the public knew. Right. Uh, and so we could work together and, and, and have their input if something needed to be tweaked. Um, I think that so while I'm, I'm, I'm confident there were other legislatures well before our time that they worked well together from time to time. It just seemed like over the last 12 years, we became a more cohesive body. We still had our differences. That's fine. That's good. That's healthy. We still had vigorous debate. That too is, is very important because we all have different viewpoints and we, have, we represent different constituents. But I think the, the partisanship um, is, is greatly diminished uh, over the years and the focus on our constituents and really advancing the state has really improved. And that, I, I guess I'm very proud of as well, uh, to have served in a body like that. And I think that's evidenced um, uh, when a lot of legislation comes up in the Senate uh, for final vote on the floor. Not every piece of legislation, but a lot of it passes by huge overwhelming uh, majorities, you know, 44 to four or 48 to zero. It's the rarity are the bills that are um, a much closer vote. Usually, because we've worked together, like you said, because we've had good conversation and able to work out uh, questions or concerns before it ever gets to a final vote, most senators are comfortable with the final product and able to vote for it regardless of which senator authored it, what political party they're from, or what part of the state they're from. So it speaks to that right. cohesiveness, I think. Yes. So um, is there anything you're going to miss in particular about serving in the Senate? <laughs> Actually, there is. Uh, I enjoy helping people. And when our office would receive a call from a constituent and they had some issue with a, a state agency or, or just some concerns about legislation and we were able to, to uh, work with them, talk to them, get their thoughts, um, if it was an issue with an agency, get involved in um, taking care of that and getting it resolved. Um, you know, I, I, I will miss uh, the direct, in, uh, you know, impact on, on, the, on constituents. Right. Uh, miss the opportunity to work with other decision makers, the other legislators. Mm -hmm. uh, I think uh, we had some great friendships on both sides of the aisles. Of, um, uh, really working together, and I'll, I'll kind of uh, I'll miss that. Um, the staff, uh, okay, so I'm biased, you know, I'm in the Senate, but I can tell you the Senate staff, whether it's our administrative, uh, our executive administrators, our EAs, or, or Senate staff um, that are at the front or behind the scenes, they just work incredibly hard. And I'll miss the, the opportunity to work with such dedicated, loyal people that uh, really want to work their best for the, for the people. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and it's evident. And so I'll, I'll miss that and that interaction with the staff and, uh, and the constituents. Uh, but I, I'm, I'm thankful for the time I was there. I'm definitely ready to pass the baton, let someone else come in with, with fresh ideas, a new vision, new way of viewing things, and, uh, and see what they can do. Uh, and so I'm, I'm looking forward to supporting whoever, whoever finally uh, gets that position. Well, here's my last question. So it's a misnomer to, to, for when people say uh, that the legislators only work four months of the year <laughs> when you're at the state capitol, because you know and I know we're behind the scenes. It's a 24-7, uh, 365 type of job. So I think I may know your answer to this question, because uh, you're probably going to get a lot of your time back. but what are you most looking forward to uh, when your service is concluded? Spending time with my family. <laughs> right. That's number one. Um, I have worked, I think, I, I'm just reflecting on that. I think I've worked every Saturday, uh, so at least six days a week since uh, the, 
uh, not the first year, but probably the second or third year since I was elected. Yeah. Uh, just the demands uh, and the um, need to, to continually educate yourself. So the number of conferences, legislative conferences I would attend, uh, to being involved in interim studies or a task force or uh, uh, working with other legislators on, on upcoming legislation to uh, solving constituent concerns. Um, uh, there's just a sheer number of hours, uh, even out of session, that, that we'd work. Um, and to get that time back, uh, I'm already starting to feel that because uh, so many of the conferences have canceled this summer. And, right. and yet I still, I, I just still feel this obligation to be involved. And so, um, whereas uh, the feeling should be, well, hey, you know, the session's over, I'm done. Uh, I just don't sense, I don't feel that way because I'm still representing my constituents. Right. So therefore I still need to be engaged. I still need to learn. Uh, and share what I have uh, with a virtual conference I'm, I'll be attending right now on education and, and giving my input that could impact other states or our state. And so, uh, so I'm still involved, but the demand for my time is already starting to de decrease. Um, I think last Saturday I didn't work at all, last couple Saturdays. And so it, just getting that time back yeah, yeah. and spending more time with my, my wife and, and different things with the kids. Uh, I'm, I'm definitely looking forward to that. Well, you, you've put in the time and the hard work. You certainly uh, have earned it and deserve it. Uh, Senator Stanislavski, thanks for joining us today on Oklahoma Senate Sit Down. Thank you for uh, your service in the Senate and all your that you've done for our state. We certainly appreciate it. Um, thanks for joining us. We appreciate it. All right. Thank you, Aaron, and uh, wish you all well going forward. God bless. And thanks for joining us here for another episode of Oklahoma Senate Sit Down. Uh, please like, share, uh, leave comments. If you have any questions for us, send us an email or, or leave a comment for us. And we'll be back with another episode soon. Thank you.